How many of you guys know that it's not really proper etiquette when the pastor's up here talking to come running up here? Unless you're a part of the family, right? The scripture says come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need, amen? And that's the same thing, that's exactly what she did. Because I, I remember years ago, Allie came running up here, I think it was Allie, and it's like, yeah, that hit me that that's, you know, I mean, some people might be intimidated or something and think that's not right to, to do something like that. But in God's eyes, amen, you're his children. And so he's never inconvenienced by you running up and jumping in his lap. That's right. Never, ever. Amen? amen. I have learned so much about God by being a father and a grandfather. It's amazing. Amen, guys? Amen. Especially your grandparents out there. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Okay, so let me get this stuff out of the way here. i got so much stuff up here. Um, I, I really am ex excited about... Um, <clears throat> I don't know, haven't you guys, have you guys sensed just the Spirit of God just drawing you closer to Him? Yes. More than, than ever before? Yes. I mean, I really have, honestly have. And I mean, I mean, that should always happen. We know that, right? But it just seems like it's ramped up. And um, it's not, it, it, it's, it's twofold. We were talking about that in the rally. Everything that happens in our life is, is, is us cooperating with God. That's really what it boils down to. And so the Spirit of God might be crying out, um, you, know, you know, you need to get closer to me, you need to get closer to me. And, um, and sometimes it's because of the times that you live in. I think we all live, can, can attest that we live in times that we've never lived in before with the coronavirus and the fear and all of the unrest, everything that's happening in our world, um, not just in America, but everywhere, right? And so um, sometimes I think that um, it's almost like a parent telling their child not to get too close to the road, you know? Get back here, get over here closer to me, come on, get over here, you know? Um, don't get too close to that. Um, that's what God's trying to say, I think, to his people, is get closer to me. Come on, don't get so far away. You need to be close, uh, because there's, there's, there's danger. Amen? And I think that the, the times we live in, uh, God's, that's why we sense an urgency more. It's because God's saying, no, no, come on, you, right now, especially now, you need to be closer to me. And I think that's where we're at. And, and so I'm, I'm just excited about the, 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 the series we're in. Um, I... We finished a series on the crucifixion of Jesus because it was Easter and I kept thinking about, you know, what it was that, that motivated Jesus and, and how he went to the cross and, and that was God on the cross, you know. Um, and then I struggled over what am I going to do next and then finally it just kind of hit me that um, the next logical thing is to look at the book of Acts because, again, um, this, the, book, the book of Acts is the outcome of what Jesus did, right? And so I want, to read, I want to read something to you out of the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 1. It says, The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John. Let's hold on a second, we're having difficulties. There we go. Um, to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. So these, these guys were watching them and while Peter was talking, Peter and John was speaking to the people, right? And then verse, they, they got, got in, uh, they drug him in and talked to him and everything. Um, and, and then this was their reaction in verse 13 of the same chapter, 4.13. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. So the actions of these men showed that they had been with Jesus. They saw the courage of them and realized that these are, these are just ordinary guys, unschooled even. These aren't even you know, just ordinary guys. These are guys that are, you know, of the rough side of life. And yet they could tell they'd been with Jesus, right? Um, and as we go through, the reason I wanted to bring that up is as we go through the book of Acts, you're going to see the effects that Jesus had not only on these two men, but a lot of people. And that's really what we see in the book of Acts is the effect that Jesus had on a lot of different people and we see it through their actions and their courage because a lot of the things that they did in the book of Acts took great courage, took great courage. The church was under immense persecution um, 
and, and it was so only going to get worse to the point that they're eventually fe being fed to lions, you know. And what was it that drove these people to the point that they would not um, give up their faith even under the threat of being fed to lions, see? And we have to ask ourselves, what, what would we do if we were under that same threat? Right? Is our faith and our dedication and our zeal and our commitment to God as strong as theirs was? You know, um, I think honestly that uh, uh, that faith does grow under persecution, yeah. um, but it can also be destroyed if it's not nurtured and, and fed. So you're gonna when when the rubber meets the road, that's where you decide whether you're gonna have faith or not faith. And if you decide to have faith then that's when it grows, right? So anyway, it's my hope in this series that you see several things. I'm going to list them. Number one, that the foundation that was laid for your salvation and your purpose in life. I hope you see the foundation that was laid in the book of Acts for your salvation and your purpose in life. If these people had not done what they did in the book of Acts, your salvation may not have been here today because they were tasked with carrying the mission of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus on after he left. Number two, that you can trust that foundation. It stood the test of time, the foundation that they set and laid. Number three, that you can feel a kinship. That's why I want you to feel a kinship with that early church because they suffered so much for you. They really honestly did. Number four, that you can sense the call of God on your life. Every one of these people sensed a great call of God on their life. In reality, when Jesus said, come and follow me, you really, if, if they, you know, maybe they didn't know it at the time, but they grew to know it. What he was saying is, come and follow me, and even to the point of death. Because every one of them were martyred, except for uh, John. Um, so anyway, that you can sense the call of God in your life. Another thing I want you to see is that you can feel that you also are empowered by God that you also are empowered by God to preach to all the world, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. I also hope that you can face any opposition in life. I hope you can see that, that you can face any opposition in life just like they did, just like they did, because they're examples for us. And then number seven, I hope that you can learn and see that you can walk in one accord just like they did. Many times in the book of Acts, it mentions that they were in one accord. In other words, they were in unity. They were in unity. Amen? So that's what I'm hoping that we can see out of this book of Acts as we go through it. Last week, I taught a sermon called Preparing the Way. Preparing the Way. I shared some scriptures that spoke of the love that Christ had for, for us. Uh, Romans 8 tells us that nothing can separate us from that love. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Okay, I talked about Jesus preparing a place so that we can go and be with him. In other words, he was saying, wherever I'm at, that's where I want you to be right there with me. And that's the heart of God. Also that he's praying for us, he's making intercession for us. He, all this is with preparation for the book of Acts. All this that he's doing is in preparation for this period of time right now. Some people have said that the book of Acts is, ne is not even finished. In other words, that the book of Acts is continuing on now because it really is all about the church, okay? <clears throat> and he said something very powerful before he left, and I want to read it to you. In John chapter 14, verse 12, it says, He said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Now notice, he tells them that they're going to be doing greater works than him, okay? But why? Because I'm going to the Father. See, so we tied in going to the Father with them doing greater works. They weren't going to be able to do greater works until he went to the Father, right? And it goes along with John 16, 7. He said this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So what he, he said, two things about going away. He says, I have to go away so that I can send the Holy Spirit, and you're going to do great works because I go away. So you can tie those great works to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So in, other, in reality, he's saying, I've got to leave so the Holy Spirit can come, and when he comes, he's going to enable you to do greater works than I do. If you remember, I talked about what those greater works are, and really what it really is, those greater works, 
is just in, in multitude, uh, in quantity, not quality. I mean, how do you get more quality than being raised from the dead, raising people from the dead, healing them, walking on water, right? Um, if, uh, being ascended up through the clouds. I mean, there aren't any more quality works that you could do, but there is quantity. Because when Jesus was on the earth, he wasn't omnipresent. He was only in one place at one time. So he could only minister to a certain amount of people. But what if you could multiply the power and the authority and the ministry of Jesus Christ millions of times all over the world? See, those are the greater works, see? And what the devil didn't understand, he'd have been better off to leave Jesus alive. <laughs> right? What he didn't understand when he killed Jesus, that, you know, that he was going to be up to his elbows in Jesus's. I know you're not Jesus, but you know what I'm getting at. In other words, you know, he's going to be overwhelmed with people that have the same power, same authority, and the same ability and same ministry that Jesus had. Amen. Through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. See? And so that was the greater works, and, and that's what we talked about. And all, everything he did was to prepare for that one, that one event that was going to take place. That one event that was going to take place in the book of Acts in chapter 2. But we, we're going to get there in just, in, in just a little bit, but we're, I want to get through a little bit on chapter 1 first. So. Um, so in the Gospels, we see the disciples following Jesus, serving him, watching him perform miracles, uh, declare that he was the Son of God, right? And, and, and even giving them for power to, to, to do miracles. They saw him arrested, tried, crucified, die, and get buried. They saw all of those things, all those wonderful things, and then all of a sudden, everything falls apart. And during that time, we saw them deny Christ. We saw them deny Christ. We saw them run and hide. When Jesus met up with them after the resurrection, he found them hiding in fear. They were hiding in fear. Later in the book of Acts, though, we see these timid, scared, discouraged men in a totally different light. And that's what we're going to discover in the book of Acts. Um, something changed them. Something happened to turn them into bold, empowered, courageous, powerful men of faith. But it wasn't so till after an event happened. And the book of Acts shows us that. Um, interesting note, uh, I want to throw some facts out. There's some trivia stuff to you every once in a while, too. The name uh, of the book was first called The Acts of the Apostles by Irenaeus in the second century. So before that, it wasn't named that. It wasn't named, it didn't have, they don't know if it even had a name. It was just, uh, it was just a, a, a historical writing, if you will, right? But uh, Irenaeus in the second century started calling it the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, no place in the Bible does it show us that it was named by the author Luke. So he didn't name it, okay? Uh, some people have said that it, should be, it would be better if it was named the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because in reality, that's exactly what, what it is, right? Um, for me, personally, um, I think either one works just fine. Actually, both work just fine, right? Um, the book of Acts spans uh, a time but between the crucifixion of Christ uh, at about 30 A.D. to about 60 A.D., to Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Okay, so about 30 years. The book of Acts spans about 30 year time period. Okay? Just a little fact, so, so you understand that all this happened in really in a relatively short period of time, okay? Um, and, and then during all of this, no other group of men have ever influenced the world in such a way as these men did. Again, I, I want you to see the foundation that was laid by these men because it took great courage and great faith to do what they did. And, and if the Bible says that, that these things were written for us for an example, then it's very clear. I mean, if something's an example for you, that means it's supposed to cause some sort of an effect on you, right? It's supposed to do something for you. And in this case, of course, it's to encourage us and understand that we can walk in the same, the same power and authority and, and overcome just like they did. So Jesus called, he trained, he commanded, he, com he empowered them to continue his work. And uh, if you look at them, they're ill-equipped for the task. They really are, okay? Um, like you said earlier, they, they were unlearned and ignorant men. They really were. Uh, the Bible also talks about that he uses the foolish things to confound the wise. Amen? Amen? Um, 
I was wondering maybe that's why I was called to be a pastor. <laughs> I don't know, but that's all right. Uh, to all appearances, the mission that they had seemed hopeless. Um, because again, if you look at them and, and, and the things that they did when Jesus was on the earth, squabbling with each other, uh, arguing over who was going to be better and, and greater in the kingdom of God, and, and all of the different things they have, you'd think, why did he pick these guys? There must have been somebody better, right? Um, I mean, if you think about it, look at Paul. This guy's killing Christians, and God picks him too. So evidently, God sees something in people we don't see, right? And I'd like to encourage you on this too. Maybe God sees something in you that you don't see. Huh? Maybe God sees something in you that you don't see. Because oftentimes, and I think it's healthy, that if God calls you to something, that you feel ill-equipped, that you feel unworthy, that you feel like you, you know, that you're not able to, or you know, it'd been better if you'd have called someone else. You know? Um, because I think that it's good to have a little humility. I don't think it'd be good to be prideful. Yeah, he called me because I'm great. But the point again is simply is that you can't allow that to hinder what God's asked you to do. If God asks you to do something, he must think you're, you're able to do it. I'm going to say that again. If God's asked you to do something, he must think you're able to do it. Amen? And I've had to, take, I've had to do that to myself, pastoring the church 20 years now. It's like sometimes it's like, are you sure, God? Well, okay, I know, I know he called me to do this. And if he called me, then I must be able to. Amen? And so that's what these guys were too, okay? Um, a little more trivia. Luke is the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament. He's the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament. He's the, also the only one that stayed with Paul throughout his entire ministry up to the end. The only one. Paul later on says, there's none that have stayed by me except, except Luke. Okay, the name Luke means giver of light. Giver of light. A little trivia, right? Um, and so that's what he endeavors to do here. He wants to give light. And we see this in the first, in the first couple of verses here. Um, for Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach. He refers to the former account. He's referring to his writings in the book of Luke. So when he says that former account, he's referring to the, the book of Luke. Notice he addresses the book to a man named Theopolis, right? It's the same one, same man that he addresses in Luke chapter 1. And let's read that. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed a good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theopolis. So he wrote the book of Luke to Theopolis, and he wrote the book of Acts to Theopolis. Uh, that you may know the certainty of those things of which you are instructed. So Theopolis had been instructed, he'd been, been taught, um, and, and he uses the term perfect understanding. He's using the Greek word that means accurate and careful. Accurate and careful. Now Luke was not one of the disciples, so he wasn't one of them that followed around with Jesus, but he became a disciple later through, through uh, Paul. Okay, so here he is, he's, he's, he's looking, um, he's, te he's writing this to Theopolis, okay? Now, um, so I wanted to find out, what, what is there about this Theopolis? Do, what do we know about him, right? There are several theories as to who he is, so, and they're just theories because we're not sure, right? Some believe he was just a friend of Luke's, just a friend of Luke's, right? Um, but it also seems reasonable to assume that whoever Theopolis was, um, that he must be interested in knowing more about Jesus, right? and about his lives and the disciples. Um, he was a convert, obviously, right? Um, he also could have been somebody very important because he, Luke addresses him as most excellent, which wasn't a term that you use for just anybody. Usually it was used for nobility or somebody high ranking or in the, in the, in the Roman army, um, so forth. So he was, he was definitely somebody uh, important. He was, he was known, right? So it wasn't just some, some friend of Luke's um, he could have been a nobleman, too. Um, the the uh, Jewish records, including Josephus, record that Theophilus was a high priest of Israel from 37 to 41 AD. So maybe he was a high priest, because there was somebody named Theophilus that was a high priest. 
And so it could have been Luke was refer referring to him. They just don't know exactly who that. Um, so anyway, um, but it also, the Bible scholars describe Theopolis as a Gentile, um, and so, but he was a man of importance. So anyway, just a little background so you know who he's talking to and why, okay? Um, but then he says this, he says, when he says all of what Jesus, all that Jesus began both to do and teach, he's referring to what he told him in the book of, of Luke. Okay, so in Acts, so, so it seems to be there's two mainstreams, the Gospels and the Acts, okay? Before ascension and after ascension. So the Gospel is concerned with what Jesus began to do and teach, and Acts concerns itself with what Jesus continues to do and teach. See, Jesus' ministry didn't end at the cross. It didn't end when he got to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of our Father, making intercession for us, okay? Um, through, and then um, he does things, you know, sent the Holy Spirit to us, and so he's continuing to minister to us today, okay? Um, so anyway, let's go on. I want to read Acts chapter 1, verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, if you remember, Jesus, when he met with them, he breathed on them, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so they received the Holy Spirit, that's when they got born again. But now he's talking about something totally different. He says, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, see? And that's why we have the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a different event than just salvation, okay? Um, so again, um, he, he was preparing them again for what was about to happen to them, an event that would light and ignite a fire on the inside of them that would burst into an inferno that would sweep the globe. It would, it would sweep across the entire world and across thousands of years. That fire that was lit there is still lit today. I want to say that again. The fire that was lit there is still lit today. Come on. Yeah. Is there any fire in the room? Amen. Okay. The fire that was lit within them is still lit today. Okay. The church that Jesus spoke of that the gates of hell would not prevail against was being born right then. Yeah. Right then. That's the church that he said the gates of hell would not prevail against. The major part of God's plan was about to be completed. The major part. Again, it was all led up to Day of Pentecost, every bit of it, because he's going to empower people to go forth in the power of Jesus. It all led up to that point. God was about to unleash the Holy Spirit upon the earth in such a way that his power would be displayed through millions of acts of his followers. See, we're talking about the book of Acts here, but in reality, millions of acts have taken place since then. Every time somebody does something for God, that's an act. Amen? So first of all, they didn't understand it. They wanted Jesus to just take over the earth. Again, they, they still, at this point, after all of that, thought that he was going to just come and take over. They saw him as a conquering Messiah. See, because there are prophecies that talk about the Messiah coming, right? And when he lands, you know, um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but, but there is a second coming of Jesus Christ. But, so, but they only saw one coming and gripped it all together. They didn't understand that he was going to come, be born of a child, live, die for our sins, create this, this church era, this church ages dispensation of the church that was going to sweep the globe. See? They didn't understand that. They thought the Messiah was simply coming to preserve and to protect and to rescue the nation of Israel. Okay? So, um, so anyway, again, that's what they're still focused on. We'll see that here. Acts 1.6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him. Here we go. Ready? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel to, to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, wait a minute, Jesus. Thought, you mean you're not coming just to rescue us? You're talking about the rest of the world? 
See, again, they didn't have the concept yet very much that the Gentiles were going to be a part of the church too, that the Gentiles were going to get saved too. See, it still was all about the nation rather than the world, right? Um, in Matthew 28, 19, though, Jesus told his disciples uh, to teach all the nations. He tells them the progression of their mission, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then the ends of the earth, right? So God wants everyone saved. He wants everyone saved. It's not just the Jewish nation. Acts uh, uh, verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now they're talking about the second coming of Christ. Okay? And then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive, Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. Now the interesting note here is that Jesus left the earth. It's really cool, I think. Jesus left the earth from the Mount of Olives. Okay? And when he returns, he's going to touch down at the Mount of Olives. The same place he left. So not only in like manner, but in like place. He's coming back to the same place he left. Isn't that cool? Because it's the uh, Revelation, I mean, I'm sorry, we'll see this in just a second, not Revelation, but the same place. And when he touches down, it says that the mountain will be split in two. And you'll find that in Zechariah, and I want us to read that, because I think it's just really cool. Because, again, ask yourself why. See, why, does he, why did he leave from the Mount of Olives, and why is he coming back to the Mount of Olives, right? Um, and why does it have to be the same place? Why couldn't it be two different locations? Leave from one place and come back to another. Right? Zechariah 14, verse 1. A day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem. A day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. He's prophesying that there there's going to be some destruction. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it, and the city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out, so he's promising them uh, a rescue. The Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north and half moving south. So in, in, we know that in tribulation, all of those horrible things, if you read the book of Revelations, all those horrible things are going to be happening, and that's what he, he told them is going to happen in the last days. This wasn't something that was going to happen in the days of Zechariah. This is a prophecy of end-time events. This is a prophecy of end-time events, and it is going to be horrible. How many are thankful that we're going to go through the rapture? Yeah. What do the rest of you think about? Yeah, absolutely. We're thankful. Amen? I... You know what, back when, when we were, um, I took a friend of mine to the hospital because um, he, he caught COVID, and, um, and I saw the line of people waiting, and, and, I, and I kept hearing about how the hospitals were so full, and, and it was not a good time at the time he was there. Um, and I thought to myself, this is just a touch of what's going to happen in tribulation. And if the hospitals are overwhelmed, with one little pandemic, and I know we think it's not little, but if you compare it to Revelation, this is little, believe me. Could you imagine one plague after another after another, worse than this, and not just one, but many, and all sorts of other things happening too, uh, hail storms, and all the difference, to read the Revelations, right? it's going to be a horrible time to live in. And, and I'm so glad that we're not going to be there. Again, that ought to make us so grateful that we serve Christ with all of our strength. It really is. I am glad I'm not going to be. Could you imagine somebody having to try to take their child to the hospital because they, they weren't believers and, and, and in tribulation and, and you can't even get a mile from the hospital because it's so backed up. And, the, and they're just telling you, just stay home. It's going to be horrific. It's going to be horrific. But then the Messiah is going to come. He's going to come. And he is going to rescue them. And he is going to set up his kingdom for a thousand years. 
Let's go on. You will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azale. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Guess who that is, guys? That's us. How many of you guys have ever ridden a horse? How many of you that have not ridden a, hor ridden a horse want to ride a horse? Well, you're going to, so you better get used to the idea. <laughs> Revelation says we're all coming back riding on white horses. Yeah. Amen? And if we're riding on white horses, why do we wearing white hats too, right? The good guys always wear white hats. So anyway, so yeah, the Holy One's with us. On that day there will be a neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. It will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord, with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. On that day, living water, come on guys, on that day, living water will flow from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea. In summer and in winter, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. And on that day, there will be one Lord in his name, the only name. Amen. Amen. That's the day that's coming. And we're going to rule and reign with him. And all the stuff that happened before that, you know, uh, will be done away with. Will be done away with. So it's interesting that the location that he left from is the same location he's coming back to. I wonder if the Jewish nation, Jews that know this book of Zechariah, when they realize after the rapture, those that do realize, later on they begin to realize Jesus is the Messiah, right? How many of them will take comfort in knowing that he left, but as he was leaving, he says, don't worry, I'm coming back. See, that's what I get out of that. Don't worry. I left from right here, I'm coming back right here. You know, right here. You know, I'm thinking about history, I love history. In World War II, MacArthur, uh, in the Philippines, they, they got driven out of the Philippines. Uh, General MacArthur, many of you may not know who he is, you younger people, but, but he promised them that he would be back. He promised them, he says, I'll be back to rescue the nation of the Philippines. And when he came back, they have, um, they have video footage of him from the stepping off that boat onto the land. See? And the significance was that, that he made a promise, and now there was a fulfillment of that promise. And here we see in the book of Acts, they said he's going to come back to the same place he left. To me, that means a lot. It does. To me, it means a lot, especially to those that might be left behind. Amen? So... Um, also, it's, um, it's at that location that Jesus informs his disciples that they're about ready to receive power from on high. Now remember, they had received power before. This is not just a promise they hadn't experienced before, right? In Matthew 10, Mark 6, and Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, show us that Jesus was giving not only the 12 disciples, but over 70 other people the ability to cast out demons, heal the sick, and raise the dead. He commanded them to do that. So when Jesus told them they would just receive power from on high, they thought that was what was going to happen again. See, because they'd already experienced it. They were already doing it, actually. But what happened to them, what was about to happen to them, I should say, was going to be something far more phenomenal, far more powerful than they'd ever experienced before. Ever experienced before. Let's go on to Acts chapter 2. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now you have to understand something here. There were promises made by God. There were promises made by God, okay, about this. The prophet Joel promised, uh, God promised to the prophet Joel, Joel 2, 28, because I'm going to tie this together. I want you to see something here. Joel 2, 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my manservants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Yeah. 
That's a prophecy of this time period right here that we're living in. Sheila, when we were in prayer last Tuesday, and I won't go into it, but use the... Uh, there's events that are happening, or at least events I've been hearing about, and things like that happening in the world that are uh, pretty significant. And Sheila, the Lord was giving her dreams, and she didn't know the stuff that I'd been hearing, but she says, we need to pray about this, and she's been, the Lord's been giving her dreams, and those dreams were exactly what I was hearing. Exactly and brought confirmation to me that those things are really happening, okay? Um, but that, that to me is a, a, a perfect example of what was prophesied right here. Right here, exactly what was happening to you and is happening to you. See, God is pouring out his spirit. Come on, God is pouring out his spirit. And I'm going to read that to you again. Your old men shall dream dreams. That's me. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So in other words, all that's going to happen to all of us. Yes. So who's it going to happen to? Whoever's willing. Whoever's willing. Because I'm here to tell you, God will use whoever is willing. So if you want his spirit poured out upon you, all you have to do is seek it. All you have to do is seek it and then it'll be obedient. Amen. Amen? All right. John the Baptist foretold the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is at coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And with fire. Zechariah again, 12.10. And I will pour on the house of David and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, when then they will look to me on me to whom they pierce Jesus uh, yes they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn so in Zechariah said the Lord said that he was going to pour out his spirit Isaiah 32:15 speaks of it Ezekiel 39:29 I'm not going to read them all speaks of it Jesus spoke of the outpouring of the spirit several times the woman at the well John 4:13 Jesus answered and said to her Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will be in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John 7, 37. On that last day, because we, we'll see this, because he's... Cause that, um, this next passage ties it together, and you'll see. So in other words, when he spoke in John 4, 13, it definitely was talking about the Holy Spirit. We'll see this in John 7, 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, talking about thirsting again, come to me and drink. Who who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. See, so what he was talking about to the woman at the well and what he was talking about here was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was prophesied, okay? So, so, why did I mention that all of these were promises? See, these prophecies are promises of something to come, right? Because look what happens when it said about the arrival of the Holy Spirit. That's why I brought this up. Acts chapter 2, verse 2. Then suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, I have worked in, with, around aircraft all of my life. All of my life, okay, guys? And when something is moving through the air at a high enough speed, you hear it coming. Okay? You hear it coming. It's a roar. Okay, uh, when you drop bombs from an airplane, they don't have engines, you don't hear engines, but you can hear the bombs screaming as they come down. You can hear something when it's moving through the air very fast. The Holy Spirit was moving through the air very fast. Very fast, okay? It says the sound came from heaven, a rushing, mighty wind. I believe that God, and this is why I brought up the promises, I believe that God so wanted to fulfill this long-awaited plan. This was a plan that was, was hatched back in the garden. This was a plan that was hatched back in the garden, guys, to restore humanity back to that, that fellowship, if you will, that God had 
with Adam and Eve with the fulfillment of being able to have the authority and the power in the earth that you're supposed to have, okay? I believe that God so wanted to fulfill that long-awaited plan, he had so badly wanted to unite himself with humanity through the Holy Spirit that the very second that it was possible, come on, the very second that all had been fulfilled, the very second that mankind was ready, God said, go. And the Holy Spirit was like just waiting, 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 and all of a sudden, it's time. Boom. And the Holy Spirit left heaven so fast, I believe you could hear a sonic boom go off. Why? Because all the passion and all the love and all of the, the, the waiting that God had waited so long to happen, all of the, the, the excitement that was inside of God fueled the Holy Spirit to come as fast as he possibly could, and they could hear him coming. You could hear the Holy Spirit coming. You could hear him coming. It was coming so fast. Unbelievable. He tore out of heaven so fast you could hear him coming. James 4, 5 says this, Don't think that there is no truth in the scripture that says the spirit of God, that God placed in us is filled with fierce desires. Fierce desires. The Holy Spirit is filled with fierce desires for you. Uh, the same scripture in a different translation. I like the way they put this. Do you think that this passage means nothing? It says the spirit that lives in us wants us to be his own. The Holy Spirit is jealous over you. The Holy Spirit wants everything in you to be part of him and him to be part of you. Think about this. The Holy Spirit is, is infusing himself in your human spirit for eternity. You've been made a new creature, cre, uh, creature a new creation in Christ. Designed to house the Holy Spirit on the inside of you with all the power and the authority that God himself gave Jesus. The same glory he said in John, in John chapter 17, he says, I give it to them. That word glory there means all that. Never doubt, never doubt the Holy Spirit's commitment to you in your life. Never doubt it. This was also, another interesting point, a reversal of the curse that happened in the Tower of Babel. This was a reversal of the curse that happened in the Tower of Babel. In the Tower of Babel, they were building it, and they were all in one language. And God says, because of that, now there will be nothing that withheld from man what they purpose to do, right? If that's true, then now that we have this universal language called tongues, come on, tie it together. See, if we have this new universal language called praying in tongues, there is nothing that would be withheld from us that we purpose to do. Come on, somebody ought to get a little excited about that. Come on. There is nothing that will be held from us because we're praying in tongues, praying God's perfect will for our lives, and not our will. Not our will. Acts 2.3 then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. I'm going to go over a little bit, guys, because we had this other stuff going on, so we're going to be a little bit late, but not bad. Okay? There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, one set upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of them in our own language in which we were born? Let's watch the video, guys. We're glad you're here, brother. This way. We must be careful, though. They're watching us. John. I'm glad you're all safe. It's good to see you again, Stephen. Matthew. What form will it take? 
When will it come? Jesus said all we had to do was ask. I have been asking. Every day. The Holy Spirit will come when the time is right. I think we should pray together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God and they were changed in an instant and none of them were ever the same they weren't hiding anymore Peter preaches in such a way and there's a scripture I read to you before we're not going to read the other scriptures I have for you right here but um, the last one is um, Acts 4 13 again it says when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men they were astonished that they took note that these men had been with Jesus come on amen Amen? The Holy Spirit. The action of God. The, the very fulfillment of God's plan. They could tell by the words and the actions of Peter and John they'd been with Jesus. So my question is this. A challenge to you in this and to me. Can people tell by your words and actions that you've been with Jesus? That's the question, isn't it? Think about what the church could do if we had encounters with Christ that energized us on such a point that we are on fire like they were. Amen? Amen? Can you imagine being in that room? Can you imagine being there? Or being in heaven and watching the Holy Spirit leave? Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Probably the biggest miracle God ever did in the Bible is right there. Right there. He infused the Holy Spirit within the spirit of men. Amazing. Amazing. So my encouragement to you is, is that if you've not been baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, you should be. I really encourage you to seek that gift because it's a gift that everyone can have. Everyone. It's the only gift given to this dispensation, really, that, that's different from any, any of the other miracles you saw in the rest of the Bible, is that one. Amen? 
Praise God. Why don't you go ahead and stand up. Did you get something from this? We'll get into more of what happened in the book of Acts in chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost um, next week. So I know that we already had an altar call for people that wanted prayer, but again, what I want to do is the same as last week, that if you need prayer, uh, please come up after. I'll go ahead and dismiss you, but if you need prayer, please come up. Johanna and I are here to pray with you. If, if you don't uh, pray in tongues and you want to, you know, that's a gift for everybody that will receive it. It's totally, you don't have to wait for it. God wants you to have it right now. So if you've not been filled with the, and had baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and you want that, we can pray for you up here for that. So again, we're going to go ahead and dismiss you. But if you need prayer for anything at all, just come on up. We're here for you guys, okay? Father God, we just thank you so much for this service. We just pray, Lord, that, that we would all take something home with us that would help us to be better Christians, that would help us to grow in our faith, grow in our mission sense, grow in our world, our biblical worldview, that we can go forth knowing that we're children of God, sent here for a purpose, put here for a purpose, with gifts given to us that we might impart your will and your grace and your love and your mercy and your healing to people around us. So again, Lord, I just thank you that we can grow by what we've learned here today. I thank you for people that have been set free, miracles that happen in people's lives, and I just believe they're going to have a great week this week. They're going to go forth with what they had here and impart it out there in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. God bless you. Again, if you need prayer, please come up here. Johanna and I are here.